Um, I want to welcome you to um, this uh, lecture by um, our distinguished uh, alum, Paul Voverding. Um, I was looking at the title of the lecture, Learning from AIDS, uh, Lessons from the Early HIV Epidemic. I uh, first met Paul a number of years ago, as a, not in his role as a uh, physician, but in his role as a uh, valuable and very dedicated alumni volunteer. Um, Paul is a professor and vice chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of California at S San Francisco, but he's done a, a great deal of work at other hospitals in the San Francisco area. Uh, he was an early and um, pioneering um, um, scientist, physician scientist in the um, discovery and treat, uh, treatment of HIV. Um, and he's had a, a remarkable career both in the scientific study of this dreadful disease, but also into, in the effective treatment of it. And um, I think uh, we're going to hear perhaps a bit of both sides today in the lecture. But I also want to uh, acknowledge that he has been a um, extraordinary uh, supporter of the college and the university, a, a dedicated volunteer, someone who uh, will fly 3,000 miles at a moment's notice to give a lecture to students in the college, which is, a, I think, a, a real testament to his, uh, his love of the university and his, uh, his uh, love of the college. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to pre present uh, Paul Wolverding, who will talk on learning from AIDS. Uh. Thanks, Dean Boyer. And um, for your uh, advantage, if you watch carefully, there'll be a slide that shows my name again, uh, phonetically spelled, so everyone can understand how to say, say Balberting. It's, it's, there's a story behind that. I'll get to it. Um, and uh, thanks to my sister, Jane, also a college uh, graduate who is celebrating her, I won't say which, birthday today. So I, it's not why I came, uh, but it's nice to be here for her birthday, too. Um, it's actually sort of bizarre to be back in this room. Um, I don't know how many of you were bio, pre-med type people. Um, I don't know if it's still the same as it was 42 years ago, uh, but I spent about every morning uh, for two years at, from eight to nine. I think I would usually sit about there with a yellow shirt. Um, so I had my place like I guess students do in the regular lectures. Um, so it's great to be back in Kent 107. Uh, the last time I tried to visit Kent um, as part of the alumni uh, governing board that I was on, um, hey Kate, <laughs> um, I, I tried to come in here and it was all roped off with radiation um, tape. And I, as I understood it, um, all the time I had been a student in this room, there was actually a fair amount of radioactivity in Kent, given that plutonium was just discovered a few doors down. Um, so it's nice that I guess it's safe to be back in, in Kent as well. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about um, this in a, in a very much a non-typical lecture uh, approach. Um, I've been working with the HIV epidemic in San Francisco for 28 years, um, and one would hope that going through something as terrible but as illuminating as I think HIV has been for us in a lot of ways, that we would have started to learn some lessons. I gave a talk at UCSF, actually at San Francisco General, which I'll talk about, SFGH is the Cook County Hospital in a much smaller scale, um, much more academic, um, but where, where a lot of the events that I'm going to talk about um, uh, happened. And for that talk, uh, which was the 25th anniversary of the, of the first cases, um, I just got up in front and told stories. Uh, it's, it worked better in that setting because I, so many of the people knew a lot of the stories and a lot of the people and a lot of the settings. Um, but I'm going to do that a little bit today. So if I wander around with my slides, don't worry. Um, I'm going to use my slides more or less just to try to keep myself uh, on some kind of pace uh, in the hopes that I can um, wander a little bit and, uh, and reminisce. Um, um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to talk a little bit about the early history of the epidemic. Um, 
consider what things are like now and talk just at the very end about some of the challenges that we still face. I, I won't talk about our work internationally, but uh, that's clearly where uh, a lot of the most uh, serious uh, challenges are. Uh, if you're interested in this, um, there's a, a really wonderful book. Uh, Randy Schultz was uh, a reporter in San Francisco, a gay man, himself uh, died of, of AIDS, uh, but before he died wrote a, a, a really, really good book on the, on the early history. Uh, I, I'm, I'm part of it, I'm in the book, and I know everyone in the book, and uh, while it's kind of journalistic in its tone, uh, good people are better than they actually were, and bad people are worse than they were. It's still factually really good, and, and I, I think it will form uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the approaches that, when when historians actually get around to thinking about what happened in this, uh, they'll have that to, to start from. Uh, I learned in the course of giving my talk at, at SFGH and talking to people and thinking about all this that there really is a role for historians. There really is uh, a role for people who are able to step back, uh, looking at source documents and, and really not being so caught up in, in, in the now. Um, and I, I learned this, and, and my wife Molly Cook, who is unfortunately a Stanford grad, not a Chicago grad, but um, is a good person anyway, uh, taught me a word that, that was useful, egocentonic, uh, which as I understand it, uh, alludes to the fact that when we think about our past, uh, when we do our memoirs or whatever, uh, our memory is invariably affected. Uh, we remember things in ways that make sense to us and to our sense of our ego, um, which doesn't mean that we're lying to ourselves, it's just that that's how we filter uh, what happened. And I was thinking about this in, in, the, in the context of conversation with one of my formerly junior colleagues, now a professor himself, uh, and I had one recollection of how I hired him. Um, he had another, and Molly had a third, uh, uh, and, and they were all really right there at the scene, so it, it convinced me that I should not pretend to be a historian. I'm a, I'm a memoirist in this sense. Um, what are some of the, uh, 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 what were things like? Uh, how did all this uh, happen? How did AIDS happen? Uh, how did it spread? And obviously, most of this is not, uh, not a surprise. Uh, what, what you might not have followed as closely as those of us uh, that, that live this is that uh, HIV can be pretty conclusively proven uh, to have uh, uh, come into human populations from chimpanzees uh, and that the, the various subtypes of HIV that we, that we, that we see uh, can be traced to separate animal to human uh, jumps uh, of the virus. The virus that uh, was in the chimpanzee population, in fact, recently we've learned uh, that it wasn't, it's probably not been in the chimpanzee population for very long either uh, because the chimpanzees are dying from, uh, from this virus in Africa now. Uh, there's really a threat that along with hunting and, and, and uh, deforestation that this will be yet another reason that the chimp population is, is really threatened. Uh, but the, but the, the virus, we think, made several separate jumps, probably in the mid-1900s into human populations, uh, in central but somewhat uh, western Africa in Gabon and Cameroon. Uh, and actually, the, the sources of some of the subtypes can be, can be kind of traced back to chimp populations in those areas. Uh, elegant, elegant work in genetics. And it probably then, for a number of decades, uh, uh, stayed uh, endemic in rather remote rural areas where it probably did what it does, kill people relatively slowly, uh, but didn't form a major epidemic until the post-colonial phase uh, when with, uh, with rapid increase in urban centers in Africa and construction of trans-African uh, highways and pipelines, which, formed the, which gave the population the ability uh, to move from one large urban area to another, uh, this virus having gotten into human populations then was able to spread in Africa. I was uh, driving uh, in Uganda, and Uganda was one of the first countries uh, now in East Africa uh, where the epidemic really, really uh, started to take off. I was driving uh, um, and 
at a town called Lukaya, uh, my driver said, this is where uh, AIDS started. Uh, and his story, and, and who knows, but it was at least a story and plausible in a sense, uh, was that in the late 1970s, all the women died uh, in this town. Uh, this was a town on the Trans-African Highway. The women were almost all sex workers uh, uh, serving the, the truckers coming through. Uh, and this was an early uh, um, a mass uh, spread of, of HIV in that population. So stories like that, I'm sure you, you'd hear them in other places. Uh, but it's, it's, there's no question that the virus, once that happened, it, it spread very rapidly. But even then, uh, no one uh, appreciated what was going on. And in fact, the first case of African AIDS uh, was reported by my friend Nathan Klumick, uh, who is a physician in Brussels. Because in the European capitals, uh, Africans uh, in, in countries that are connected uh, to the colonial days, uh, if you're relatively wealthy and you get sick in Africa, uh, you would often go to seek medical care in the colonial capital, in, in this case from Zaire, uh, to go to Brussels. Uh, so he was seeing cases uh, in Brussels of what looked like AIDS uh, as it had been reported. And he had a, a, a paper in 1984 first reporting African AIDS, even though that's where the epidemic started. This is a cheesy sort of uh, uh, newspaper uh, diagram. I, I urge you not to look at it as source data, um, especially Dean Boyer. Uh, but while the numbers don't make any real sense, probably, this, the sense that this is a jet age epidemic. And epidemics always use the most rapid means of transportation available to them. Uh, this was probably the first major epidemic that was able to spread almost instantaneously worldwide. Uh, so when we saw cases in San Francisco in 1970, or infections in San Francisco in 1977, 78, it's really only probably a couple years after the virus really made it uh, in terms of that jump in the, in the African urban populations. In the United States, the epidemic, as, as the old people in the audience will remember, spread very rapidly. I like this ancient uh, thing from the CDC, just that uh, this... this uh, uh, these dots, I mean, th this is my dot, uh, the cases that we were seeing in San Francisco, uh, and how quickly, in the, in the space of the first uh, 10 years of, of the epidemic, it spread uh, to involve most of the country. Now, I'm from Minnesota, and it's interesting that North and South Dakota seem to be spared, uh, at least for the first decade of the epidemic. I, I assume that's no longer uh, the case. Um, what did we think about this uh, uh, epidemic? First of all, I can remember well when we first had the ability to diagnose uh, the, the antibody test. So when we could first take a person's blood and find out if, if he or she had been exposed to the, to the virus. Uh, what we found is that um, this infection had affected a much larger number of people than we ever would have guessed. Uh, so it spreads very silently. It's, it's, it's really designed. Uh, to be a dangerous epidemic. Uh, it's spread uh, by uh, ubiquitous activities. It's spread by sexual contact, uh, and it's spread by uh, exposure to blood. Uh, so if it's blood transfusions, which is how a lot of it was, was spread in the early days, hemophilia uh, or injection drug use, these are things that just are out there and, and happening. And so the epidemic affected a larger number of people than we expected, but the, the paradigm that we would usually have in infectious disease where uh, we would expect the minority of people with an infection uh, to actually uh, be productively infected and, uh, and diseased uh, was turned on its head in this, uh, in this disease. Essentially, uh, everyone with HIV infection without treatment dies. Um, there are probably about 2 or 3% of people with the infection who have uh, been living with their infection without progressing for a very long time. We're studying them in, uh, very intensively now, uh, but this is an infection without natural immunity. And when I talk at the very end about vaccines, and when you hear the stories in the press in the last couple of weeks that there may be some benefit from a vaccine, uh, it's, it's a, it turns out to be a very difficult thing to make a vaccine that does better than nature. Uh, if nature doesn't give us a model of natural immunity to 
uh, to use in thinking about vaccine design, we're not very good yet. Um, and that's been the case uh, of this disease. So it's a unique uh, disease. I, I, I would, I, in my lectures, I would often say this is the most uh, mortal infection in, in that, we, that we've ever seen. And, and then I was corrected once to point out that uh, rabies, symptomatic rabies, is actually worse than HIV. Nobody has recovered from symptomatic rabies, although then a couple years ago there was actually a single case of a person who did. So rabies is still worse, but there's not as much rabies as there is HIV infection. Uh, no surprise as the, as, uh, the epidemic spread and the mortality played out that these, this kind of curve uh, was something that, that, that happened early in the epidemic. Um, but so we had a, a rapidly spreading fatal infectious disease uh, th that uh, was, was rather mysterious. And I want to talk then uh, a little bit about the response. Um, and I'll set the stage. Um, I'm, I'm actually doing, I'm thinking a lot about the history of, of the AIDS epidemic right now. I was asked, asked to give a big lecture in uh, Philadelphia in a few weeks on this topic. And I thought, you know, it, it, it's not my story so much. I can tell stories, but there are a lot of people who were there that contributed to this response. Um, and some of them uh, have already died of various things, uh, including HIV in some cases. Um, so I, I, I'm doing something unique to me. I'm actually, I went out and raised money and I'm pro and producing a video uh, of this where I interviewed a number of the, of the people. So it's, I haven't even seen it yet, but we have 100 hours of film to, to edit in a couple weeks. Uh, but, I, but I think it is important to try to get the, the stories, um, uh, to, at least to get as many people's egos and tonic uh, recollections as, as we can before we're all gone. And so I want to talk just, just really quickly about the medical community, the affected population in San Francisco that's mostly gay men, and the political response as well. Um, and to set the stage, uh, I moved to San Francisco in 1978. Uh, which is about when the virus actually, we, we now know, hit. Um, we know that because there had been an epidemiology study uh, of hepatitis B in, in, uh, in high-risk populations, which again is, is very definitely includes sexually active gay men. So in, that, in the course of that study, they'd been taking serum specimens, fr uh, freezing them away, um, as it, really in the context of hepatitis B. But we were able to then go back and look at those thaw them out and test for HIV once that, once that test was available. Uh, so we know the virus came in 77, 78. Uh, at the time, the gay liberation movement had really uh, exploded in San Francisco. As part of my video, I interviewed Cleve Jones, who was one of the people in Milk. I don't know if anyone saw the ac really excellent movie. Um, and he talked about the spirit of lightness and it was like a party, and definitely part of that was anonymous, multiple sexual contacts. Uh, so that was what was happening in the gay community. And what was happening in the medical community before HIV was there was no, there was no crosstalk at all. So you had the gay community over here, the medical community over here, and we had, there was no sense of health issues of uh, gay and lesbians. Um, we, just, we didn't talk about it, even though, even in cities like San Francisco. Um, the political scene in San Francisco when the AIDS uh, epidemic hit uh, was definitely affected uh, by our mayor, now Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, who took office, uh, again as you would know from, uh, from Milk, uh, as, a, as a result of the Milk Moscone murders. Uh, and having taken office as a result of, a, of, a, of a basically a gay-directed uh, assassination, my sense is that she must have been more than willing to be supportive, and it was a time of a city budget surplus. So when the epidemic took off and I was d developing my, uh, my clinic, uh, we could get support without her having to take it from anyone else. So it was basically easy, uh, easy support to get in the early days. Uh, my life at that time was really at the, again, at the public hospital, San Francisco General Hospital, uh, which is, Again, it's part of UCSF. It's, uh, it, it serves the poor uh, people of San Francisco. Um, and this is the first patient that I saw literally on my first day uh, on the job. So I, I had 
started training in virus labs here. I, I worked in, in, a, in a virus lab at, at, at the pediatric hospital, and it was called Weiler Children's Hospital. Um, I worked in a, in a virus lab in med school in Minnesota, and, and then I went to San Francisco to work in a, in a virus lab, so I'd been working with viruses. I decided I didn't want to stay in the lab. I took a clinical job at San Francisco General Hospital to develop uh, a cancer service, and literally on my first day, on July 1st, 81, this is the patient that I saw who was the first patient with AIDS, uh, more or less recognized as such, uh, who was admitted to the hospital. Uh, so I was, I was talking a bit earlier in the day, I walked from a retrovirus lab to a retrovirus epidemic without really missing a beat. And to, to show how people were, were thinking at, at that time, I, I was rounding, uh, seeing patients with one of my fellows who had just moved from, from New York. It was his first day in San Francisco, and he said, gee, I think we saw some of those patients in New York City, and this was before there was any publication at all. So even before there was publication, there was already this very effective word of mouth um, uh, uh, sharing, and we, we called his friends in New York and compared notes. Uh, but the disease, it wasn't subtle. Uh, this is a 22-year-old man uh, covered with Kaposi sarcoma lesions, wasting from this disease, uh, and I'll show another shot later, and it's not meant to be gross or anything, uh, but to point out that uh, when I start talking about the fear that, uh, that was part of the early response, it was understandable. This was a new disease. We had no clue what was happening. Um, we, it took us a couple years before we really even thought of it as an infectious disease. Um, we should have recognized it earlier, but we didn't. Uh, but we knew it was really bad, and... Uh, there's a reason that, the, that, that we were concerned. This was my boss, this is Merle Sandy, who was one of the voices that we couldn't have in the video because he died about uh, two years ago from uh, multiple myeloma from a cancer. Uh, but Merle hired me, uh, actually hired me and my wife uh, to, to work at San Francisco General Hospital uh, and uh, was really quite visionary in terms of the, uh, developing the, uh, the, the programs that we have. I don't have time to go into that, but it was really important. I like this shot just to show that I used to be younger than I am now. Um, and again, 42 years ago, I took chemistry in this room. Ah, hard to imagine. Uh, this is what I looked like uh, before, <laughs> before then. Uh, again, with one of my colleagues, Marcus Conant, who is a, a dermatologist who also... Uh, started seeing some of these cases. There was a time, you have to realize that in San Francisco, there were probably in the range of 50,000 people infected quickly uh, with this virus. Uh, but there was a time when Marcus and I could put the names of all of the people with AIDS in San Francisco on one blackboard. Also point out that I don't think whiteboards had been invented yet. Um, but, you know, it was, it was very much a homegrown response to, uh, to this. Uh, and, and my colleague, Connie Wasi, uh, who, was, uh, who died of breast cancer, uh, at the same, really at the same time that so-called triple therapy or finally effective uh, treatments became available. Uh, Connie is remarkable in many ways, including the fact that she was really one of the first people in the, in the world uh, to, to start raising the issues of AIDS in women. Uh, at a time and at a place in San Francisco where there weren't very many cases of AIDS in women, but, but, but she saw what was happening. And uh, if, you, if you watch the epidemic internationally, this is, this is a, a very important part of the, part of the is issue. One of our, uh, I was using an exam space in the main hospital uh, to see my patients as, a, as clinic rooms. The interns and residents uh, would use those same beds that I was using to, as, to examine my patients during the day. They would use them to sleep in at night. And in December of 82, one of the residents, Dia Angelillo, um, said, well, I, I've learned I'm pregnant. Do, I, do we know that it's safe for me to sleep in the beds that were used during the day for these patients? And the hospital, to their credit, without missing a beat, said, we don't know that it's safe. Uh, we have to move the the AIDS uh, clinic somewhere else, and so that was, the, that was the origin of the world's first AIDS clinic. So the first AIDS clinic opened on J January 1st, 1983, as a direct result of this issue of protecting the health of, of one, of our, one of our house staff. 
I was given half of the floor and it quickly grew, but the, but the role of San Francisco General Hospital is really, is, was really key. Now, the, the, I mentioned that there really wasn't um, much of a history of crosstalk between the medical and the gay communities. Uh, and I realized that in trying to take care of some of these early patients where my cancer patients without HIV, uh, even poor recent immigrants would typically have something of a family uh, that would participate uh, in the outpatient care. Um, with a lot of these early patients, like the one I showed you, these were people that were estranged from their families uh, at an early age. Uh, that patient was basically ejected from the family when he was, uh, as I remember it, in his mid-teens because they realized he was, he realized he was gay and they realized that he was gay and so he was sent away. Uh, so they were uh, often without anything approaching, I'll put quotes in the air, a real family. So in terms of, in terms of tr taking care of these really sick people, it left us with a, with a huge challenge. And to its Im immense credit, the gay community, again, without missing much of a beat, responded to this. Organizations changed their structure to, re to deliver services for these patients, and new organizations were formed to do this as well. Uh, so I just listed some, some of the organizations. They don't matter, um, but uh, but it was a, a really key thing, and basically what they allowed was the creation of what functionally became the patient's family. So there were organizations that delivered food. There were organizations that assisted with legal issues or housing issues. Uh, there were organizations that uh, uh, offered buddies uh, for, for patients, so patients would, people would take care of each other and help, help them get back and forth to clinic. It was an incredible part of uh, the response. Separate from the activism, that I'll talk about uh, in a minute. I mentioned AIDS in politics and Dianne Feinstein. Uh, the other name there uh, uh, that, was, that was really important in the early responses are Health Director Murr Silverman. Uh, they got into, though, a very um, public fight. One of the issues that, that uh, San Francisco faced in the early AIDS epidemic is that gay men used bathhouses, not to take baths, um, but as p places for public anonymous sex. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, you, you, you're seeing this rapidly spreading, horrible um, sexually transmitted infection, and you have commercial establishments where you know the virus is being transmitted. Um, I, at one point, uh, and all this is in Randy Schultz's book, by the way, but I, I at one point, said, me being me, I'll, I'll, maybe the bathhouse owners just don't understand uh, what's going on. So I invited them all to my clinic so I could give them basically a slideshow of this disease. They showed up, they showed up with their lawyers, and the first thing they said was, we don't want to see any ugly photographs. We know what's going on. And it was clear that it was pretty cynical. It was, that, that was their business. Uh, and so the city at some point, uh, really led by uh, Mayor Feinstein, said we should close them down. We, should, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't allow uh, businesses to be licensed um, where we know this is happening. It's a public health menace. And she put immense pressure on Merv Silverman, the health director, uh, who was also under intense pressure from the gay community who saw these as part of their sexual freedom. So this was freedom of expression on the one hand, public health on the other, uh, with, a, with, a, with a very uh, hard clash in the middle. Uh, and I, I talked to Merv about it as part of the, the again, the video that I'm, that I'm doing, and his response was interesting. He said the rule number one in public health is when, when you have a problem, you get everyone to the table. He said you bring all the sides to the table, and to Merv's credit, he did that, and we had hours-long meetings week after week in his office to try to resolve this. Uh, in the end, he couldn't resolve it, um, and they ended up closing the bathhouses down. Uh, but it was, uh, it was, a, it was a real, um, I, think, I think, again, when the, his, the real history is, is written, it will be a, a subject that, uh, that will deserve um, some careful analysis. So, another one of our patients. Um, what he has is Kaposi's sarcoma, uh, the purple 
cancer on the skin. It's all, throughout his whole body. It's not just on the skin. Um, the, the, the cancer causes blockage of the, of the vessels, the lymphatic vessels that drain fluid from tissues back to the heart. Patients with this would often, and you have to understand that in a clinic, in a, in a clinic taking care of sick people, the staff of the clinic, the receptionists, the phlebotomists, the nurses, get to know and think of the patients as their family. They come in all of the time, and it's a very supportive environment. These patients would sometimes, in the space of a week, block off their drainage uh, of their lymphatics from their head and come into clinic with their faces ballooned uh, with fluid. They couldn't hear because the canals were closed with fluid in the ears, and they couldn't see, they couldn't open their eyes because, because of the swelling. And the patients would, in some cases, not be recognizable by the staff. So in terms of a horrible disease, uh, this, this was up there with anything that any of us had ever seen. Raising kind of an, a, a, a point of fear, AIDS, and ethics, and, and, and again, it deserves a, a careful and, and deep analysis uh, because things happen that make us proud in retrospect and make us not so proud in retrospect. Um, I, I mentioned that if you had trouble with my name, uh, if, if you could see this photograph, it would help you. Um, <laughs> but this is a, a shot my, my kids uh, last year, um, because the name Valberding doesn't flow off the tongue very easily. So they made these hoodies uh, with the name spelled phonetically um, that we used as our Christmas card uh, photo last year. Um, we were in San Diego and we had some passerby snap the shot. Um, this actually, and this is not part of my lecture really, but I'll say it anyway, it gave rise to some d discord within our family because it turned out that some of us say it one way and some another way, which I don't think most family names uh, have that problem. So it's either bulberding or balberding. So whatever. The point of this is if you look at uh, Molly and my kids, um, Alex, our oldest, was born in 1981, Ben was born in 1984, and Emily was born in 1987. So born during the time that Molly and I, Molly's a physician as well, also working with AIDS patients at San Francisco General Hospital. And these kids were all born at a time when we didn't know that we hadn't infected them with this virus. And my recurring nightmare was that that's what had happened. And it, it was, we have a good relationship. We can talk about most things. We couldn't talk about it. We, we, it was, there was so much fear that we just, without saying anything, we never talked about our fear until years later. Uh, and I know that a lot of other people had, uh, had that reaction. Jerry Grubman, who is a well-known physician writer in The New Yorker now, called me at one point. He was at UCLA at the time. And, he had had some illness and thought, and the question was, I think I have it. At least, again, that's how I remember the phone call. Um, but, and, it, and without having to say what it was. So there was intense fear, and some of us just decided to keep doing our work. Uh, and, and again, in the people that I've been interviewing, uh, the analog analogy that a lot of people make is, look, if you're a fireman, you can't decide you're not going to go in the burning building. It's, it's just your job. And the history of medicine uh, is, has always been one that physicians are out there. Pa physicians are putting themselves at risk. Um, you know, and we don't always do it nobly and, and all that, but that's the expectation. Uh, but there were some physicians, this is Lorraine Day, who is the head of orthopedic surgery at San Francisco General Hospital that really just went off the other end, uh, and she insisted on triple gowning and masking, and, which would be OK. Uh, but then we had the sense, the clear sense, that some patients weren't getting operated on if she knew or thought they had HIV infection. And that's a big eth ethical issue. Uh, somebody comes in with a broken bone that otherwise would get set in the operating room and instead they're getting a cast put on and being sent home, um, that, that struck us as unethical. 
uh, and it gave rise to, uh, again, a pretty wrenching period in the, in the medical establishment. It wasn't just at SFGH. Um, it was in other places, too. And there were cases of patients that were what we call dumped uh, from one hospital to another, sent. One patient sent from San Jose. It's about an hour and a half south of us to San Francisco General Hospital. He'd gone to an ER there. He was dying um, of pneumonia. They gave him a portable oxygen tank, put him in a taxi cab, and said to drive to San Francisco General Hospital. So there were those, uh, those ethical lapses. Uh, but I think, again, when this is looked at critically in retrospect, for the most part, uh, the, the physicians did a, a, a really fairly noble job of responding appropriately, even when we didn't know exactly what our, what our risk was. I'm not going to talk about it, but one of the other issues that, that we very consciously did uh, was work with the press. So this was, you, you can't imagine it today, uh, but for about six or seven years, AIDS was in every newspaper every day, it, at least in the big cities. Um, it was on the news stations. There were camera crews in our hallways. Um, we, we were the only division in internal medicine in the world, I'm sure, with our own full-time media coordinator. And a lot of us then worked with the press to help uh, talk about our response to, um, to, to counter some of the other, uh, the other approaches. A little bit about the, the science. Um, if, if, there's a, if there's any key point, it's probably this word, investing, uh, because uh, early on, again, we knew that we really didn't understand what was happening. I was on a, a committee at the Institute of Medicine, which is part of the National Academy of Sciences, and the, the, the chair of the committee, Howard Temin, who's a wonderful guy, a Nobel Prize winner from, uh, from Wisconsin, uh, said, we should invest new money in this research that clearly if we don't understand the problem, the way we approach this as academics is to invest, to, to do basic research. And he made, in the report, he made the uh, really uh, remarkable step, too, of saying, and this money uh, shouldn't come at the expense of other, of other research. It should be new research money. So just as Diane Feinstein was able to grow clinical programs without, um, without having to challenge other parts of, 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 of services in the city, uh, the NIH did create new money uh, for, for HIV research. Uh, and, it, and it rapidly uh, expanded and resulted very quickly in understanding uh, more about the natural history uh, and biology of this disease than any other infection we'd seen, and paying off clearly today still in terms of treatments for influenza and, and other diagnostic approaches. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's itself a pretty good story. It's, it's fun going back and looking at, because I've been talking about AIDS for, again, 28 years, uh, at some of our earlier slides. This is from an era, th this is probably actually at least in the era of some kind of computer generation. Uh, this one isn't. Um, in the, in, I don't think anyone in the room is old enough to know that there was a time when the, you made slides by typing things out and putting a sheet of paper on, on the table and you'd have a camera that would actually take a photograph. So you would make photographs of things. This is obviously a typed out uh, thing. We didn't know at all what was happening. So here was my speculation at some point, probably in 1982. Uh, maybe it was recreational drug use that was happening, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't know, but um, at least um, we thought that there were some viruses involved, existing viruses, and if you look back at this one, um, even before we had a, a better sense of the, of the progression of this disease, we knew that there must be uh, carriers of it as well, which obviously proved to be uh, all too true. Another really old slide, but one that was hugely important in our field. I, I like um, slides. This is from a, from a New England Journal uh, paper uh, that end up being very important teaching tools. Um, and there are a few of them, I'm sure there are a few of them in every uh, field of science and medicine, but this was a really important one. This one sort of encapsulated what we knew uh, about the natural history of HIV, from the acute infection to the progression of disease later, 
the, the amount of virus in the blood and the effect on the, on the, on the T cells, the cells of the immune system. Um, I'm not going to go through this in, in any detail except to say that it was, even though it was done early uh, in the epidemic, it, it really it was a, a very useful uh, document. Um, another useful uh, uh, way to think of this is this. Again, it's a cartoon from my friend Warner Green. Uh, and again, without going through it in any detail at all, uh, we quickly, because the investment in basic science, understood the, the mechanisms of this virus life cycle uh, amazingly well. And, and basically, each step of the life cycle that we unraveled uh, has become a point for de developing anti-HIV uh, treatments. Uh, and our treatments are, uh, as I'll show you in a second, pretty spectacular. The early treatments really were not spectacular. This is AZT. Uh, and uh, the thing I remember most about AZT is uh, that if you were, had to be given uh, every four hours. So I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hand of who of you take medicine, but very few people take medicine that has to be taken regularly more than twice a day. It proves to be almost impossible to remember to take a medicine uh, three times a day. These people were taking this six times a day, and to help them remember how to take it, they would have these little beepers that would go off every four hours. And if you, were, if you had the misfortune of giving a lecture at, at a community event in that era, um, and, the, and, the, and the hour was at 4, 8, or 12, because it's kind of human nature that if you're going to do things every four hours, you use, do it on the fours, right? The room would erupt with, uh, with beeps as everyone was reminded to take their AZT. I don't know if you've seen the movie Rent or the play, but there's a scene in that that to those of us that were in that era uh, rang true to life when the beeper goes off to remind him to take his AZT. Um, it didn't do very much. It was very toxic. It was, it was the first drug developed, so there was no there was no sense of what drugs for AIDS should cost. Uh, and it really triggered this whole field of AIDS activism, which is another legacy of the AIDS epidemic, another lesson that has clearly uh, affected the rest, of, uh, the rest of American medicine, the rest of international medicine. Today, it's not surprising that you see breast cancer uh, advocacy or colon cancer uh, advocacy, but it really started with HIV. And it really started as a reaction against what was perceived as an expensive, toxic, and not very effective drug. Uh, and a lot of us were tar a lot of us that were helping develop the treatments were really attacked, sometimes physically, for uh, for our work. Uh, we sometimes did the right thing, though. And this is a, a, another favorite uh, slide of it's a favorite to me, at least, because uh, I'm in it uh, there. Um, but also, uh, June Osborne, who was the Dean of Public Health at Michigan for a long time and has had a number of other uh, uh, great activities, including the J Josiah Macy uh, Foundation. But Jonathan Mann, who played, a, again, a, a really important early role in the uh, World Health Organization, who died in the Swiss Air uh, crash a number of years ago, another person who has who's been taken away. This was a, 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 a march that we had in San Francisco in 1990, where the physicians and the delegates to the conference uh, got together with activism uh, to, to, to push for various reforms. Um, I'm going to, I really want to save a little bit of time for any questions that, that you have at the end, but um, where did things go? In 1996, uh, the world changed. Uh, and HIV, in terms of, again, what's happened in medicine that makes this so unique, uh, we went from a frightening, horrible, I hope I've kind of underscored that enough, a really bad disease, to a disease that is not very frightening to a lot of people anymore. Uh, HIV is now a chronic disease. Uh, people can take meds, they work. I'll talk a bit, a bit about that. Um, and I'll talk about why that's a challenge as well. Um, it happened with this trial, this, I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not going to walk you through it, but basically, if you think of this as success on this axis, uh, success with even Two of the standard drugs that we were using was essentially zero. Success, when you put three drugs together, uh, approached 80 percent. Um, and this was success measured by being able to drive the virus back into uh, submission, basically. Um, the result of this, uh, this is another one of those 
key slides from the AIDS epidemic. Frank Palella, who is an epidemiologist at, at, at Northwestern downtown, uh, put this together showing that with the use of these new therapies, uh, the death rate plummeted um, and uh, death still happened from HIV, but usually from people that aren't receiving the therapy for different reasons. This is my favorite slide probably. Uh, in San Francisco, there's a, a, a newspaper in the gay community that uh, during the epidemic uh, would always have either two or three or sometimes four pages of little obits, little photos, little kind of short paragraphs about people who had died. And they thought it was remarkable enough in, at this one um, in 1998, no obits for that issue of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Bay Area Reporter. Uh, I was talking to a, a Lutheran minister uh, uh, in, the, in the Castro, in the gay neighborhood, uh, who said at the height of the epidemic, uh, they lost 10% of their congregation annually died from AIDS. I don't know, can you imagine 10% of, of a population dying every year and they had a full-time assistant minister that did nothing uh, but minister to the, to the patients with AIDS uh, to the point where you, know, you could go a whole... I think this comes out every other week uh, without any, uh, any deaths. Benefits from, from our investment, uh, not, not subtle. Um, it rapidly went from a subacute disease to a treatable one. Uh, we got, we've gotten rid of basically all the side effects, most of them at least from our drugs. Uh, we don't use drugs like AZT anymore that causes, cause a lot of side effects. Uh, the treatments are compact. The most popular treatment for HIV right now is one pill once a day. So one pill once a day with three medicines embedded in it um, is an incredibly potent uh, combination that basically, in 100%, I'm exaggerating only slightly, in 100% of cases, drives the virus into submission. Um, this did something that we kind of predicted, uh, which is, I haven't talked about the international epidemic, but we were obviously seeing tremendous advances in taking care of this disease here. And we started realizing, uh, and, and some of our programs started branching out to uh, form programs in Africa. Uh, Merle Sandy, again, my uh, uh, boss, started a program very early on in Uganda uh, again, which was a, a, an epicenter for the African AIDS uh, problem. Uh, at first, there was not much you could do, but when our drugs started becoming available, it led some people to dream uh, that maybe these drugs could be, uh, could be uh, gotten uh, to people in Africa. And uh, it's, it's been a, itself a remarkable story. Uh, and, if, and if you were to say, what's the main challenge that I see internationally it's all about treatment. It's about getting the drugs to more people, uh, but questions of sustainability in the face of economic declines are giant issues. Uh, this is really expensive to do. Uh, this is creating systems of health care in places with no systems of health care. It's getting to po populations that are remarkably rural. People that have worked in Africa know uh, that while the cities are, are uh, there's big populations in the cities. There's, it's still a very rural uh, continent in, in most areas uh, where people live uh, off the grid uh, in, in almost all re respects. So finding them, getting them the medicines, um, getting them a sustainable supply, uh, because if you don't take the medicines on an absolutely religious daily basis, your virus will become resistant and they won't work. Um, so the challenge is not one of science so much anymore unless you think about what we call operational uh, research, uh, but it's about getting treatment uh, uh, to people who really, uh, who really need it. One of the uh, other stories, and this is almost my last uh, slide, is, is uh, how AIDS has affected public policy. Um, it, it's, it's also been a good story. Uh, and remarkably, our country, while we don't always pull together so well, uh, pretty much did so with, with HIV. Um, it's called the Ryan White Act, the, the federal support for HIV treatments. Uh, that is the, it's the mechanism that almost everyone gets, gets their HIV treatment in this country. Uh, but it was really originally called the Kennedy Hatch Bill. Uh, so a, a Republican and a Democrat getting together to, and named it after the, the boy in Indi Indiana uh, with hemophilia. Uh, but uh, but it, it's been a good story. 
Americans with Disabilities Act uh, recognized HIV and uh, incorporated that in the ADA as, as well uh, without, without much kickback uh, from anyone. Skip the rest of that. What is the, what is the problem that we have? And, and this is just to say that while HIV can be an easily, it can be an easily treatable infection, um, the problem that we have, and if you go to Cook County or if you go to San Francisco General Hospital emergency room, what you'll still see are people coming in with very advanced AIDS. Um, and it's because we have a lot of people with, for different reasons, complicated, social reasons, lack of access to health care. It's not just financial, although that's a big one, uh, but these are people with disrupted lives, disrupted um, uh, histories. We have people, I've had patients who are third or fourth generation injection drug users. Um, there's not a lot of good modeling going on that, that helps these people understand uh, uh, the importance of, of, of chronic medical care. Uh, so a lot of people that don't know they're infected and a lot of people because of that or for other reasons that are still transmitting this virus. So the CDC now estimates 60,000 Americans are still getting infected annually with HIV in this country, uh, which is a disgrace. Um, it's, you know, if we, if we could treat them easily, we could at least deal with the problem. But again, that's contributing to this, to this challenge of, of people transmitting their infection. So many undiagnosed people, many newly infected. Prevention uh, has not really done all that much. Um, prevention in the gay community worked for a period of time when it was in the news. It's not working as well anymore. It's not working in communities of color very well. Uh, so uh, a lot of issues. We don't have a vaccine. Um, again, as I said earlier in my talk, uh, I'm not at all optimistic. I think we don't understand the basic nature of protection against this type of virus well enough to expect a vaccine to do much. And if you try to imagine a vaccine in uh, less developed countries, uh, this thing that came out in the news a couple weeks ago, which was a vaccination e uh, every month for six months to get a slight effect is just not a realistic, it doesn't work at all that way where you can't find the same pe people uh, twice. So the challenge is, is, is huge and it's uh, one of sustainability. So lessons learned, I hope I've, I've raised some of those. Uh, and I'll close with this. This is the uh, AIDS quilt. Again, I keep coming up with Cleve Jones, uh, the guy who uh, started this, uh, this quilt when, when it was on display in the National Mall. Uh, but, but again, I, I hope when the story is told uh, uh, that people will appreciate the, the nature of the community response. Medical community, uh, the community of affected uh, and infected people, uh, and again, working with the political process. So again, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for having me here, and thanks for braving the rain to, uh, to come to my talk. Thank you. And a few minutes at least. Questions? Stunned silence? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, does the virus change over time in the setting of treatment uh, to cause problems later on? Uh, I didn't do it justice, but the issue of drug resistance is a giant problem. Uh, it turns out with the potency of drugs that we have now, if you take your medicines exactly as prescribed, uh, we think you, we know you can do it safely for years without that happening. Uh, but people, often forget to take medicines exactly as prescribed. Uh, people, you know, they forget to take, the medicine runs out, they go on a trip, uh, and if that happens, uh, the virus can develop resistance to the drugs that you're on. Fortunately, we now have enough uh, uh, drugs in different classes that are hitting the virus in different places that we can usually kind of salvage those bad situations at least a couple times. Uh, but there still are people who are going to be dying of HIV because of that reason, for sure. No, that's a really good question, too. Um, when the virus becomes resistant, it be, does it become more infectious? Actually, when the virus becomes resistant, it typically becomes what we call less fit. So the, the, the environment of the virus without the presence of the drug selects for the virus that's the best virus. Uh, when the virus has resistance mutations, it's actually a somewhat weakened virus. So re resistant virus doesn't spread as, as readily as wild-type virus, which is a good thing. Same is true in tuberculosis. 
So even though we worry a lot about, uh, about drug-resistant tuberculosis, it's not quite as effectively spread as, as, as non-resistant. Yeah, this shout out, how much it costs? So the cost of, uh, th this is antiretroviral therapy, which is our jargon for it. Um, probably wholesale costs about twelve to $15,000 a year, uh, which in terms of cost benefit is really cheap um, in, term in terms of life years saved. Uh, and also remember that in our crazy system of healthcare, no one really, or very few people, very few people, pay anything very much out of their own pocket for their drugs. Either they've got great insurance programs that pay almost all of it, or they're on Ryan White uh, supplements, which pays all of it. Um, so it's, it's expensive, but it's not been a individually usually a problem. Yeah. So the question is, what, what's going on? What am I doing internationally? I, I'm, I'm pretty involved in, in Uganda. and Actually, most of my colleagues who have been doing this business for as long as I have are now working in Africa or Asia or Eastern Europe for, or South America, so working in settings where um, it's, you know, it's a great experience to see what can happen to help, you know, transform the health. I think the, the, the excitement of not just doing it for AIDS, but for, you know, starting with TB and malaria, but other things as well. I'm now involved in trying to expand uh, cancer care in Africa. Uh, other people that have worked with HIV are interested in mental health issues in Africa, which, you know, there just aren't services at all for people with mental illness. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I'm a cancer specialist who took care of AIDS patients that all died um, and survived myself. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I, think we, I think if we can maintain the commitment from our government, uh, the leadership that I'll reveal my politics remarkably under our previous administration, uh, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, dramatic. The, the Bush PEPFAR program was a, a, a huge success. And it's now one of my former, one of the guys that I hired uh, at SFGH is now running the program, uh, Ambassador Eric Goosby, uh, big bear of a guy, good guy. All right, one last question. Great, great question. So the question was, this is a zoonotic infection. It's the one that went from one species to another one to us. Um, and pointing out that this isn't the only time that's happened. It's happened since in the case of swine flu and avian uh, flu and, and other infections as well. It's really hard. It's, I mean, it's hard to prevent HIV spreading from one human to another human where we have theoretically, I guess, more control over the, over the dynamics. But there are things, you know, that people are doing. Uh, some of it is completely irrational. The Egyptians killing all of their pigs because of the uh, H1N1. Uh, you know, yeah, that'll stop pig-human transmission, but there are other problems. So I, I don't have a great answer. Um, it's, it's absolutely something that people think about. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of my last thoughts is Beatrice Hahn is the person, the scientist at University of Alabama, Birmingham, who really di un who discovered the nature of the jumps uh, from chimps. That, uh, that work has turned her into a primate uh, 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 activist, so she's now committed to preserving the, the wild chimpanzee population. So it's not answering your question at all, but I shout out to Beatrice. Yeah, thank you.